record, so we're on recording now. Um, everybody's been doing great on the homework. Um, I know logistically sometimes it's tough getting acclimated to getting things in. Uh, we'll talk about it again, uh, sending the returns in. Uh, that's usually the tough one, getting it in and out of the uh, uh, format from TaxWise and putting it into a PDF to send it in, uh, making sure we get all the forms and such. Uh, speaking of the problems, <clears throat> one thing I'm going to do, um, I will send out this weekend uh, with your recordings and, and homework assignments is I am going to include the answers for everything um, from, oh, can everybody hear me okay? I got somebody that uh, can't hear. Can I get, uh, does everybody else hear me okay? If you can type in the chat there. Okay, uh, when you signed in, did everybody make sure they signed in and turn their mics? They're joining the meeting by the, the sound. Okay, I see a couple where the mics are not on. Okay. All right. Why don't you see uh, those that can't hear um, might uh, sign out of the meeting and sign back in and make sure that uh, you have it. So we'll give you just a couple minutes here to sign out and sign back in, uh, making sure that uh, the meeting you can hear the that you uh, join the the audio. Okay. All right, we got somebody in. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to remember how to do that. If you go down in the left corner, um, looks like everybody's good. Okay. Yeah, down the left corner by the microphone, there's a little carrot that should pop up. And uh, It shows the selections of your microphone and select a speaker. Maybe make sure that you got your speakers on there. Okay. All right. Okay. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, start going through things here. A uh, little bit to cover today. It won't be too bad. Um, you know, we have some things. I want to go some through some of the homework that I assigned to you. Um, I hope the, uh, the drop box is working well for everybody. Um, I know I put in there some things that are um, pertinent to the materials. Some of the PDFs that I have to sign, send out, uh, they are um, pretty large, so I'll put them in the drop box when I send stuff out. Um, I sent out a New York State considerations is in there uh, for everybody because we, as we go along farther in some of this stuff, we, we start to talk about that and uh, even though New York is a state that does use uh, the uh, numbers from the federal uh, to start its return, uh, they do um, have some considerations where we have things there. So, okay. All right. And uh, yep, you know, I see down there that the answers will be helpful. Um, I, as an instructor, we have them. I do not hand out the workbook problem uh, answers uh, beforehand. Um, what I've found from teaching is that I get an awful lot of uh, reverse engineering, if you will, where somebody is so caught up on getting the right answer as it appears uh, that sometimes they kind of forget to, to learn the, the, the forms and the law and the software to have things work through there. So that's why uh, after you've done the problems, we've talked about them, then I'll send out the answers uh, so everybody will have those to kind of look at their problems too. Um, if you specifically want certain problems as far as the PDFs, um, I guess what I could do is I'll start putting uh, some of the PDFs of the uh, problems, uh, the workbook problems into the uh, uh, Dropbox so that you can have those, okay? All right, so we have that. Uh, talked about that a little logistics. Like I said, I, I hope the Dropbox worked well for everybody, okay? Um, we had a few uh, exercises that I had you do. Um, I know I had you do uh, turn in 4C and 4D. 
Um, you know, just wanted to make sure on those that those are the things that you have that uh, that have um, uh, talk about uh, alimony. Uh, 4C was the ones that uh, you know, considering what payments are considered alimony and what payments are not considered alimony. Um, you know, the tough one. I just have to stress to everybody that the fact is that you know the alimony changed with 2019. So if your divorce uh, or separation decree uh, was effective after January 1st, 2019, um, then that income from alimony is not taxable and uh, the uh, payments that were made by the individual are no longer an adjustment or uh, deduction from their, their adjusted gross income. So that was the big thing on that. Uh, the other ones that I had uh, signed were uh, problems uh, with the quiz. Um, Okay. Yeah, we're still getting some people dropping in and out. The Wi-Fi is kind of uncertain with everything. So I got a text from somebody that was in and now they dropped out. Uh, the quizzes on chapter four. Um, again, you know, a lot of the good questions in there. Uh, you know, a lot of things we're talking about the alimony, where it goes. Um, you know, again, what type of payment uh, it was listed. Um, you know, so four on those. So what, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, just because of the, the, the limited time we have, is I'm gonna kind of go through um, a couple of the problems starting out, um, you know, that we did, that were assigned. Um, let's see here, actually we'll talk a little bit. Give me one second here, I gotta get my shared screen up. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Let's see, where did it go? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not good. There we are. Okay. So in chapter four, um, you know, I like I said, we talked about the uh the two exercises there. As far as the quiz, um, again, you know, I think I notified everybody that the, the uh, answers are, are there in the, the, the back um, for everybody as far as the, uh, the exercises. Um, the big thing I wanna stress uh, with a lot of the exercises that you do, uh, especially when you're filling out the forms uh, that they have you doing by hand uh, through there for the exercises where, you know, you're learning how the forms work, how the questions work to do the calculations. You know, software does a lot of the calculation for you, but I want you to understand, you know, how those numbers and where those numbers come from. The other thing is, is reading those questions that they ask in there. Um, you know, again, I talked earlier on one of the lectures about the flow chart. Uh, the big thing with the flow charts are that they're very good because they, they really enhance your interview skills when you go to do a return you'll be able to take a look and say, okay, well, if they answer yes to this question, then I have to ask them about this, or I need this number, or I look for this number from you know, previous year's return or whatever it may be. So you really start to learn those sequences that uh, you have to get the information from the client, uh, what maybe tax form you need to ask for or from them. And then the other thing is, is that, uh, like I said, you know, it allows you sometimes to, to do your due diligence because there's specific questions that says, hey, if they don't meet this, um, we've talked about qualifying, but if they don't meet this, then we have to you know, kind of go back and, and uh, get the information or have them provide that information uh, for us to be able to file, okay? Um, you know, as far as the quiz, uh, we'll kind of review those. Uh, alimony is taxable to the recipient. It is included on the tax form 1040 uh, schedule one and that's on line 11. Uh, the second question on the quiz was, what type of payment listed below is considered alimony payment? Um, again, those ones, property, non-cash settlement, that is not child support, is not alimony. Uh, can't stress that one enough. But uh, C, money in the form of cash checks or money order, uh, that is considered alimony, okay? Uh, unemployment compensation is reported to the taxpayer in which form? is that form 1099G. And as I've said, uh, that form is no longer mailed to anybody. 
Um, you have to either go online if you're doing your unemployment uh, through the uh, Labor Department's portal, or if you're calling in to do it, uh, they have to call and have it mailed to them. Uh, even the local labor departments have, you know, they just no longer will have, allow people to come in and have it printed out so we can get the taxes done. So, you know, that's one of those things. And, and, and again, you know, when you're doing taxes, if you have somebody that had an unemployment at the start of a tax year, and now it's, you know, over a year, or maybe almost a year and a half since they started or received unemployment, um, you know, you got to make sure you ask the questions and uh, we'll make sure on that. Okay. Um, we had on the question four, if the taxpayer received an overpayment of unemployment compensation during 2018, the amount of overpayment needs to be listed on the form 1040 schedule one on what line? That's line 19. Um, ordinary dividends are taxed as ordinary income. They are not taxed at a capital gains rate, okay? Um, very important one, I know from the problems, uh, again, we'll go through and talk more about those, but that statement is true, what, excuse me, what statement is true concerning the interest from treasury bills, okay? Um, taxable on the federal, but not taxable on the state. Um, as I pointed out, that one little chart that exists in your book uh, that uh, has the, the items that have interest, and then it has a column for federal and a column for state. Um, very, very good. Um, you know, that's something you need to have. And the only one that really kind of gets to be an exception to that is muni bonds or municipal bonds, uh, because you have to make sure that you understand whatever state the taxpayer is a resident of those municipal bonds are not taxable. But if that's a person is a, a resident of New York and they're receiving interest from municipal bonds from Pennsylvania, then that is taxable on the state. So it's very important to do that and take a look at that, okay? All right, um, let's see here. Uh, what type of income is reported on a W2G? That's gambling winnings. And again, I can't stress enough. You know, you can, you have to report gambling winnings. It's not the case that when somebody receives gambling winnings that they automatically get to take the losses against it and don't have to report it. Winnings are reported as income. Losses up to and equal to the gambling winnings may be used, but that is on your Schedule A. If you don't itemize, then it's just part of your standard deduction, but you still need to claim those winnings. And again, you know, the, the win-loss statements that just show a negative for the year for somebody at a casino um, just don't stand up in an audit. They're not itemized enough. So people need to make sure that they understand that they have to report the winnings separate from the losses. It's not a net number and says, oh, I didn't win any money for the year because I had losses. It's not the case. You report the winnings, you know, online um, on the Schedule 1 and uh, the 1040 and the, the losses on the Schedule A that's attached to the 1040, okay? Um, number eight talks about where on the tax return is income over $400 listed uh, on the 1099 miscellaneous box seven, okay? Haven't really covered that, but it will, we'll, we'll get into that when we get into self-employment. Uh, but once it's over $400, uh, that non-employed compensation, um, it'll go on Schedule C. Um, as I said, you know, this is one, the 1099 miscellaneous can get really confusing because there's a lot of uh, incorrect use of it between box three for other income and box seven uh, for non-employed compensation. The nice thing is starting in 2020, box seven is going to be removed from the 1099 miscellaneous and uh, actually it's going to be on its own 1099. Uh, that'll be called a 1099. I think they said they're going to call it dash uh, NEC for non-employed compensation. So that one will be great because Anybody that's self-employed and has payment on a 1099 like that, uh, it'll be a totally separate document from what we typically see, okay? All right. Uh, nine, all taxpayers must include their state refund on their tax return. Um, actually, that is false. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit in the problems today that we work on uh, that I'll do with you here. Um, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, you report your state refund if you itemize the previous year, um, but there is a, can be adjustments to that state refund and we'll cover that. 
Um, and uh, question 10, what type of income is taxable to the taxpayer? Um, when we look at that, child support is not, federal income tax refunds are not, I guess so far, you know, you never know, they might change that. Uh, unemployment is taxable. Workers' comp is not taxable, okay? So, all right, okay. All right. And then uh, the last question on 11 there, uh, Form 1099-C cancellation debt uh, would be listed as income on the tax return on which line and form? Um, that is line one, excuse me, schedule one, line 21. And again, that is, uh, you know, that cancellation debt, whether it be from a car, uh, credit card that uh, you settled less than a full balance. Uh, again, we'll talk about some of those when we go through the problems and get a little bit more specific on some of that. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So we have that. Okay. All right. So we're good there. Okay. Uh, what was the answer to number eight? Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, Schedule C. Okay. Oh, I saw somebody help me out there in the chat. That's great. Thank you. But uh, yeah, so Schedule C um, is where that non employee. And again, that one gets a little tricky um, because, uh, you know, the other income. Uh, like I mentioned, the one that uh, there was really a lot of errors in 2018 uh, by people that were um, issuing 1099 miscellaneous was the whole um, uh, the Paid Family Leave Act. Uh, some of them were putting it under non-employee compensation, but it should have been under other income, okay? So, you know, Family Leave Act that somebody takes time out, uh, somebody has a baby and they get to take six months or nine months or whatever after the birth of the baby or around the birth of the baby, um, that is not self-employment. Um, so, you know, there were a lot of firms that were handling uh, um, the Paid Family Leave Act for the first time and they were considering that non-employee compensation and we had to make some corrections and kind of go back and forth with them on some of that, okay? All right, uh, let's see here. From the workbook, uh, let's see here. We had... Okay, so let me, give me one second, and I'm going to get my software open here for tax problems and close down on me. Okay, so I'm getting my software open. Um, if you want to open your workbooks, um, what we're going to do, um, I had assigned you guys, uh, let's see here, from the workbook, I had signed your problems 4, 2, 4, 3, uh, 4, 4, 5, 2, 5, 3. We'll start out since we're kind of reviewing stuff. Um, we're going to take a look at, uh, I know I did 4, 1 in there, but uh, we're going to take a look at those other problems. We'll just kind of go through them um, and just kind of talk about various things that are in there. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, give me one second. Get my software open here.
<clears throat> okay. All right, one second here. Apologize, it just doesn't want to open the one I want to do. Okay, all right. Try one more time here. All right.
Okay, so we got it. There we go. Okay. And Okay, so we have Rob and Susanna Simpson. Um, you know, the big thing is uh, when you do the problems to make sure that uh, out of the workbook, make sure you read the bullet points. All right, uh, that second bullet, or excuse me, the first bullet point there says uh, Rob and Susanna filed a 1040 last year. Uh, they were not able to itemize. Well, we know from uh, talking about this already that when uh, you're unable to itemize uh, the previous year, it does not make your state refund taxable. Um, it does say here they received $216 from their state refund last year. They would like to file a joint return for 2018 and will not itemize this year. So that bullet point, a little bit of a trick, okay? Uh, what I mean by that is that they're giving you information that really didn't pertain, okay? So that 216 is not claimed, all right? So that is not something that you would uh, put on the tax return. It is not a taxable refund. Okay, um, talks about uh, depositing their checking account. Um, we use the main info, which is uh, already completed here. Um, the fourth bullet point down says, Susanna is a homemaker. She enjoys listening to the radio and called and won concert tickets to see Trans-Siberian Orchestra with dinner and a limousine. Well, this is something that yes, is taxable, okay? Uh, when these radio stations and, and places give away something, it is really something that is, um, you know, something that they write off as a promotional expense. And anytime you have uh, the IRS sees it as a two sides to an equation, anytime you have one side where somebody is writing off an expense, somebody on the other side has to be declaring it as taxable income because they want their share of that money. Um, Rob was, had some unemployment. Um, his tax form is included in here. Uh, that third to the last bullet point, Rob and Susanna, uh, neither one was a full-time student or they received any distributions from retirement plans. Uh, you see that in all of it. And a lot of times people will say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, in the case where somebody has uh, contributions to a retirement account, either a deduction, payroll deduction, where they would be contributing to a 401k through their employer, or they're making contributions to an IRA that they show up on uh, their tax return, which we'll cover when we get to adjustments in income. Um, what that is, is there is, if your income's below a threshold, you get what's called the saver's credit, okay? You get a credit for contributing to your own retirement. So the government's saying, hey, thank you for supporting your own retirement and not totally counting on social security. And if your income is below that certain level, then you will file a form 8880. Um, if they're eligible, the, the software will know. On the tree on the left, a form 8880 will light up. And then those two points that we just talked about there, those are questions that would be answered there, okay? Um, no EIC was disallowed. Again, that's important. If somebody was not allowed to take an EIC uh, in a previous year, we have to fill out a form to justify that they would be um, you know, able to take it for this year. Okay, and then the last bullet point there talks about uh, Rob and Susanna had health insurance for the entire year. Um, that's important too because uh, you know we're doing 18 returns, and and that is the last year that the mandate exists. Uh, what I mean by the mandate is that you re are required to have health insurance uh, for 2019. That mandate has gone away. Um, what I mean by that is that the mandate. Uh, that says you have to have health insurance or you pay a penalty on your tax return will no longer be in, in the case. Um, there are still forms for health insurance for those that go through the New York State Marketplace and get a subsidy or credit, but there's no mandate, no penalty, okay? All right, so we have everything there. All right, and we went through the main info sheet. Uh, you know, as it says there, uh, Rob is a transcri uh, transcriptionist. Um, Susanna is a homemaker. Um, personally, um, nobody's just a homemaker. Um, I, I have personal preference that uh, I like to call them domestic engineers. Um, I read an article one time that uh, that is the correct term. So if somebody has a resume and they wanna put it on there, they can say they're a domestic engineer. Um, and the article went on to say that a domestic engineer uh, will make roughly $252,000 a year. Granted, we don't have to put that on the tax return. It's not taxable income. 
uh, but when they're playing the role of a chauffeur, uh, they're playing the role of a nurse, doctor, um, chef, uh, you know, dry cleaner, you know, maid service, whatever it may be, all the roles and the time that they do it and you add that up, then that's what they should be paid. So for those of you out there that uh, have friends or yourselves and you're doing just uh, as a, uh, a homemaker, you know, make sure that you uh, take and, and get your share. So, um, yep, a good comment there. Somebody said that uh, I work harder at home than at work. I would agree with that. I would agree with that, okay? I guess this time of year, you gotta be part electrician. Um, you know, maybe you're a mechanic, you know, you're, you're a lumberjack, getting the firewood ready, whatever it may be, okay? All right, so they're doing a married filing joint return. Uh, we had no dependents on the return for them, okay? Uh, you can see we're doing an e-file. Uh, when you're doing these, don't worry about the bank information that says here when it says select your bank. Uh, you don't have to do anything there. That's that's for something that you'll learn. Um, um, should you work for us, you get into the office and you'll be able to um, uh, do products where people have the fee for the return taken out of the refund. So that's what that is. But, you know, we would enter their bank information. Uh, they want a direct deposit, so that would go in there. Okay. Um, you know, as far as the PIN number, I've talked about this. You know, just use their zip code. That's fine. Okay. Um, ID verification, again, when you get into the office, obviously they'll have their driver's license so you can prove identity and you'll be able to pull that information there, okay? Um, the PIN number that is here, um, if you have an individual that's been a victim of identity theft, uh, some of them should be getting their letters very soon. Usually those come out November, early December. Uh, the IRS will send them a letter with a six digit PIN on it and that is something that they're required um, to put on there so that protects their identity. Um, that six digit pin also shows up um, on the dependent line. Uh, somebody that uh, maybe has a child uh, from parents that are separated and sometimes we see the race to get to the finish line and file the return first. Um, you know, one parent should not be claiming that, only one has the right. Well, that person then can get that six digit identity theft pin to prevent somebody from taking the child that should not, okay? And then you got your ID information down at the bottom, okay? All right, so the first thing we had in there was uh, W-2 uh, for Rob, and um, I've talked about navigating to get the W-2s. Um, there's really three ways. Um, you know, you can do it, uh, you know, by, if you go to the W, or the 1040 page two, uh, lighten up that uh, first box, hit an F9, it'll bring up that little window that gives you all the options there. You can see we already have a W-2 filled out there. Um, either that or you can do uh, two other things that you can do on there. You can go up to add a form up here at the top. Uh, you click on that, there's a little search at the top right. Uh, you type in W-2 or you can just find, uh, there's usually a first W-2 blank on the tree on the left. Um, in this case, it's right over there by our 1099G on the left side. Um, I'm a tree person. Some people do not like the tree, but I am a tree person. Um, I like to have it there so that, uh, you know, it, it helps me see, you know, have I done something that's made another form be generated because all of a sudden I'll have, um, like I mentioned earlier about the savers credit, I'll have that, that form pop open on the tree on the left, have that little red exclamation point beside it, and then I'll have to address it, okay? All right, so in this case, we got our W-2, all right, and we have that there. Um, thing to remember with the fields in the software and when you get here, um, if the writing, or excuse me, if the, 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 the inside the black box is in yellow, that means calculated entry. What that means is that that is already something that's flowed from somewhere else. In this case, since we check taxpayer at the top, we have Rob Simpson's name already populated because it came from our main info. Same thing when we check the box for the employer's address, or excuse me, the taxpayer's address, that will go there. Make sure if the address is different on the W-2 that you correct it by checking the next box. You can see when I do that, this turn gray for me, allow me to edit it but you know, we type that in. 
Uh, reason for that is if we ever had to produce a facsimile of the W-2 for the individual. And we see this a lot when people are completing FAFSAs because you know FAFSAs usually use the tax return two years removed. So for anybody that had students that started this fall in college for 2019, they were using your 2017 tax return. And if you had to provide any supporting documentation outside of your tax return, you know, a lot of people go, what did I do with it? Or Murphy's Law, I'm missing the only year that I need. And uh, we have them coming in and then we can make that up. But in order for it to be accurate, we have to reproduce it just as it was when they handed it to us. Um, employer ID went in there for this one. Um, name code again is auto, uh, auto fill or auto generated. Uh, we put in the wages, the $55,444, and they had $5,400 in tax withheld, okay? Um, in this case, we had nothing for tips. Uh, we had a box 12 down here, there's nothing there. Uh, this is one where, you know, again, if their income is such, um, in this box here under code that I just lighted up in light blue, um, that's where you would probably put a D and if they had a contribution to a retirement account. So that would go in there, and the amount would go in there. Um, it would just, so if, if I put a D in there, and they made a contribution of $1,000 to the retirement account, okay? You can see what happened is that made it say, okay, our wages are 56,000 in box three, our uh, taxable wages in box one are 1,000 less because we're doing tax-free uh, income. And as you can see on the tree on the left, um, right here, and I just clicked on it, it created an 8880 with the red explanation point, and there's those questions, okay? So in the case of uh, Rob and Susanna, who have an adjusted gross income of roughly $58,000, uh, because he was contributing to his 401k, we'd answer those questions. And if they are not students, and you know they didn't do anything here, you can see down at the bottom, they get a $100 credit to help with their tax bill for him contributing $1,000. So very good thing. You know, obviously 401ks for people planning for retirement are good all the way around. Um, you know, tax-free money going in uh, with the plans that your tax rate will be lower when you take the money out when you retire. Uh, the other thing is with 401ks, a lot of times employers are matching, so that's found money. And then the third thing is you come to your tax return, lowers your taxable income, and may even generate you a credit that will lower your tax bill. So all good things all the way around, okay? All right, so just so that we have this corrected, I'm gonna take that back out of there, okay? Um, over here, box 14, you know, you'll see that default. Um, that's something that you can see in the New York considerations uh, in the Dropbox that I sent to you, uh, but we have that there, okay? And again, there might be something over here where this, uh, some contribution inside of there uh, may result in that. So we would have that too, okay? All right, okay, so we have that. Um, and then down below, you know, and again, when I've started this W-2, I've been doing this, a lot of things I've been doing right up here at the top, I always stress to my students, you know, when you're putting on that New York stuff, New York kind of gets out of sight, out of mind, all right? First thing is it's hiding on the bottom of the tree on the left. Second thing is on the W-2, the withholding kind of hides down at the bottom. Third thing is in the software, when I'm on the W-2, you know, I have to remember hiding way down here at the bottom, I gotta put in my New York withholding, okay? So we have all that in there, all right? Uh, the next document we had was some interest income, okay? Uh, interest income, we put on the return. Now, in this case, I go to the Schedule B. I cannot stress enough, just for the sake of your sanity, okay, that you interest and dividends go on the Schedule B, but you do not type on the Schedule B, okay? So interest and dividends on the Schedule B, but do not type on the Schedule B, okay? What you will do is you will go in here, light up that first box, hit F9. We have a, uh, you, we could do a new one, but in this case, we're doing an interest statement. It's a little worksheet that's there. So we go to that. And on that uh, interest worksheet, 
we have First National Bank. Um, as we saw there on page 413 in the workbook, we have our interest income. And then again, federal tax withholding. So I'm putting that on there, all right? And that way it will flow everywhere I need it to go. So just from that, I can put in there and look at my 1040. There's my $1,200, okay? And down here at the bottom, as part of my federal income tax withheld, that $400 is in there and it carries over to my uh, 1040 where it needs to carry over to, okay? All right. Then on page 414, we had a couple little uh, statements. One was unemployment, all right? So as I'm here, um, on the uh, 1040, you know, I don't see anywhere to put it. Uh, so I can start to work my way through my uh, schedules. Well, my schedule one, income and adjustments to income. Here's some income. I see my unemployment compensation. Again, I go over, light up the box, hit F9. All right, and you can see that there's a 1099G worksheet that we have. And in this case, it's from the New York State Department of Labor. Uh, again, everything's green, okay? So we type in all the information. And again, make sure you get the withholding down here at the bottom. In this case, you had withholding, same thing, New York State. Uh, one thing that happens is this does not default to New York State. So you have to type in if it's from New York or whatever state it may be and do the withholding, okay? So we have that. Now, the last thing we're gonna have is, uh, if we remember, our domestic engineer, while she's doing her many duties, has been listening to the radio and won some tickets. So we have that. We go back to our schedule one, all right? And remember, other income. So we're gonna go down, light up our box on 21, hit F9. It takes us to our little worksheet here for other income. We'll light that up, hit OK. All right, and now we are on our uh, uh, line, uh, excuse me, our worksheet for other income. And you can see line two, it has 1099 miscellaneous and for, it should say boxes, but it says lines, three, seven, and eight. We put that in there, okay? So you can put that right in there. Now, some people, what they will do on this one also is down here where we have these blank lines. Um, this is where you could type in 1099, 1099 miscellaneous WBUF radio and put the income so that you have a little more detail. Uh, the other thing that you could do uh, down there too, um, there is not a 1099C uh, for cancellation of debt. So that's where you could put in there. So if I'm down here, I could do 1099 and do a C and say it was uh, from a credit card and it was $1,000. I can, whoops, $1,000. I could put that in there and that's where that would go and then it would flow over to the form for me, okay? Okay. All right, so we have that one. Um, so we have everything in there. Back to the schedule one. Uh, if you remember from the bullet point, I talked about the fact that we had uh, itemized deductions and, or excuse me, the bullet point where we had a refund and did you itemize last year? Well, they did not, okay? So they do not have anything there to put in. So on line 10, they do not have any income to claim, okay? All right, so that is the one for, that was problem, uh, let's see, what was that? I'm sorry, four two, okay, that we had for the Simpsons. And again, I'm recording this, so you'll have the opportunity to go back and take a look at some of the steps that I did and kind of pause things. Um, Maria Hurricane, uh, that one's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, really what that one is, is uh, just realizing that um, um, she uh, had uh, alimony that she had that she had to declare. Uh, there's no tax documents with it. And so she wanted to do that and have that money, that $1,200 a month go in there, um, you know, for that. Uh, sometimes one thing people will forget, um, you know, alimony, if somebody's, uh, uh, Divorce was, uh, you know, finalized before uh, 2019, um, and that income is in there. Good chances because there's not withholding, and, you know, on alimony uh, to reduce the tax bill. Somebody that uh, is uh, receiving alimony can make contributions to a retirement account. 
Uh, when we get to adjustments to income, we'll see how that benefits us uh, in a later chapter. But this is the case where you can use that uh, to reduce the tax liability. And it's still something within that that they can make contributions to retirement accounts and adjust, uh, lower their adjusted gross income to help their tax liability. Okay. And the last one we had uh, that was signed out of there was uh, uh, Ray Crabtree. Okay. And he had a cancellation of debt. Um, I just kind of showed that on there that we had that within that. Um, where you put that on the, uh, the form that was there. And again, all these problems, I'm gonna send out uh, the answers for you so that you'll have those, okay? All right, okay. All right, now, real quick, uh, we're gonna go over to chapter five and, oops, get up right here, okay. All right, so we're gonna go over to chapter five. Um, I had signed you a couple uh, exercises out of there, 5A and 5B, and let me get to those pages. Uh, we kind of talked about, you know, the difference between the credits and things like that, uh, very good ones. You know, obviously a big thing in this one was the earned income credit, um, you know, and again, up there at the start of the chapter, you know, really get an understanding on that, um, on the differences between deductions and credits and non-refundable credit and refundable credit, okay? So those are important ones, all right? Okay, so in this one, we had a couple exercises that I wanted to go through. Um, a, lot of, a lot of forms in here, so we have a lot of things that you're doing on that. Uh, so, you know, like I said, all these are gonna help you kind of with your uh, interview skills because they're questions that are there, okay? All right, so, we get to uh, the section here and uh, 5A, um, what we wanted to take a look at here and talk about is the fact that uh, we had uh, some things about earned income. And I love to go over these because, uh, you know, for a lot of people, um, you know, you can make sure you understand, uh, for lack of a better term, the, the sweet spot, who qualifies for in earned income credit, making sure that you get uh, to maximize that for them on the return. and you know, if they're not eligible for it, you have to be able to understand uh, and explain to them why. Uh, so we'll kind of go through these on, on the, the, the questions here, okay? All right, so we have uh, some earned incomes, $24,340, married filing joints with three kids, all right? Sweet spot, okay? So they're gonna max out that earned income credit of $6,431. So very good credit for them, okay? Second one, we have uh, uh, $4,951 for head of household with one child. Uh, that earned income credit is $1,692. You know, household with very low income, but you know, the earned income credit climbs as you uh, increase your earned income. Not just because your income is below a th certain threshold do you get to maximize that earned income credit, it is based on the fact that, you know, as you increase your earned income, the earned income credit goes up, kind of reaches a plateau for a while, and then drops off. And remember that 58,000 mark uh, where, you know, married filing joint three kids, kind of where it finally fades away. And when it fades away, the last credit, earned income credit, $4. Okay, so you can see it does fade away quite a ways, okay? Uh, earned income, 28855 single person, two kids, uh, 3565 would be their earned income credit. Uh, the D there, $17,110. Uh, married filing joint with two kids. Uh, again, pretty good earned income credit, 5716. Uh, letter E, 23608 married filing separate with two kids. Well, remember, this is one of those credits. Soon as that married filing separate uh, status uh, for the return, soon as that happens, everything is off the table. So that means that this is a credit they are not eligible for. So they would not receive the earned income credit in that situation. Uh, 13,694 head of household with two kids, uh, $5,470. And then the last one, $10,200, a single person 
with no children. Even if you have no qualifying children, you still may be eligible for the earned income credit. It is a lot smaller when we do not have qualifying children, but you are still eligible for that. And in this case, it was $386, okay? All right, some very good ones here, because these are scenarios, kind of more lifelike ones, if you will. Uh, we had James and Mary, uh, they lived together all year long. Uh, two children, they used the married filing separate filing status, okay? Well, we can almost stop there, all right? Goes on to all these things about the, the income and, and such. Well, as soon as we hear married filing separate, earned income credits off the table, so they're not allowed to take it. Wanda Jones provided a home for her daughter, 17, all year long. She used the head of household filing status. Her AGI is $39,900. Can she claim the credit? Yes, okay. And with that, she's just below the cutoff, so she can get $63. All right, question three, Larry and Sandy Smith filed a jointly on their tax return. Their dependent grandson lived with them all year. Their income was from pension, interest, and social security. Their income amounted to 19,000. Can they claim the credit? Well, it sounds like married filing joint, uh, have a qualifying child, but they cannot because their income did not have an earned income source. Uh, a lot of times too, um, when we have baby boomers that might have some earned income or whatever it may be, and they have a grandchild um, or somebody like that, or grandparents with a grandchild and their income and things, but sometimes they have a lot of investments in bonds, a lot of earned, uh, investment income. Remember, as soon as that investment income goes over $3,500, that earned income credit is off the table. So what I'm saying with that, whether it's investment income like that, or say in this case, Larry and Sandy lived in a double and they rented out the other half and their net income, and that is investment income or income property um, from the, uh, that was greater than $3,500 from the other half of their double, earned income credit off the table, okay? Uh, Maria Sampson, 67, is single and self-supporting. Her in, earned income and AGI is $9,100. All right, is Maria able to claim the credit? No, uh, she's not able to take it because she is over the age of 65. Remember, there are some age um, as far as the eligibility. Eligibility, excuse me. Jack Demick, 24, uses the single filing status. Earned income and AGI were 10,500. Can he claim the credit this year? No, he's under 25. You know, again, sweet spots for those earned income credit. There's certain incomes and you have to be between the age of 25 and 65, okay? Sandy, four is the daughter of Jim Jones and Shirley Brosh, I guess we'll go, uh, who live together all year. The couple is not married. Jim's AGI is 24 and Shirley's income is 15,000. Shirley and Jim cannot agree on who should take the child. They want the IRS to make that decision. Is Shirley allowed to take the credit? Well, First of all, uh, just a piece of advice for my clients, I would hope that they would work together and make the decision and not leave their life up to the IRS. Um, as we probably all know, the last thing we wanna do is have a government or government agency making the decisions for us. We, we'd like to think we can make our own, but in this case, uh, they could not agree, so they said, well, let the IRS decide since we can't agree. Well, as soon as the IRS is here, uh, the IRS will choose the highest AGI. Okay, so no, Shirley can't take the credit because they went with Jim's AGI, okay? Now, the last two questions are very good ones and, and make sure you follow the points here and I'll try to emphasize them. Uh, Jim and Fran Bates were uh, excuse me, divorced on May of 2018. They have one son, Jared. Jim was granted a divorce decree uh, stating that he can use Jared as a dependent on his tax return. Jared has lived with his mother since May. Jim's AGI was 24,000 and Franz was 12. Jim would like to use Jared for EIC purposes. Is he able to take the credit? And the answer is no, okay, because he is not the custodial parent. Uh, remember with EIC, that qualifying child, one of those things is who is the custodial or residential parent, okay? Now, using the information from problem seven, could Fran claim Jared for EIC purposes? 
Yes, she can, okay? So what happens a lot of times in situations like this, when we have divorced parents, what can happen is mom can file as head of household with the child, and she can take the child for the EIC purposes. Dad maybe has higher income, all right, which is the case here, and the child tax credit would be beneficial for him. So what Fran could do in this situation is take the EIC, and she could also release the dependency, um, you know, having the return, and on Jim's return, we could put Jared, okay? And I'll show you when we do one of the problems, but what happens here is that basically the child is on two returns, but not really. He's on one return as a dependent for the child tax credit for Jim, and on the other return on Franz, um, Jared is on there for the EIC, which, you know, again, for the household, it makes sense. It maximizes things that could happen. Sometimes we'll do different scenarios, and if that works, that it maximizes. Um, I tell my clients that uh, up front, hey, you know, I'm here to maximize, you know, you know, your refunds, you know, within the law. And if there's a case that there's a child, I'm going to be the proponent of that child to make sure that you both have the maximum refunds for that child and you use for that child. So that's a case where you can do that. And again, when we get into problems, we'll take a little closer look at that. Okay. All right. So those are the two problems from there that I wanted to take a look at. And I know describing that verbally can be a little bit confusing, uh, but I just kind of wanted to, to go through that. Okay. All right. From the workbook, we had a sign five, two, and five, three. Uh, let's see here. Okay, we have. Okay. All right. So from uh, let's take a look at five two. We had George and Jean. So let me get that one up here. Give me one second. Hopefully it works a little better this time. <clears throat> so I am on page, uh, let's see, 510 in your workbook, okay? And mine's disappeared. <clears throat> okay. 
All right. Well, I'll see if I can find this one. We'll go through it after after the break. Okay. Because I did this one for you because I wanted to show you on some of the things that were on there. And it apparently has disappeared on me. So okay. All right. So we'll come back to that one. Okay. All right. So what we're gonna do, um, while I locate this problem, okay, uh, let's see, it is, uh, bu, 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 let's see here, um, chapter five quiz, I saw we had something there, um, not going to go through those, I wanted to spend a little time on the problems, but uh, I'll go through them real quick after the break, we'll go through those, uh, so since it's, uh, let's see here, I have, 1008. So why don't we say 1015? We'll be back. Uh, so we'll take a short break. Um, I want to find this problem. We'll hit chapter five quiz and then uh, we'll go through six and seven. Uh, those are pretty quick chapters to go through, really. And then we'll do some more problems where we can talk about stuff. So I'll see everybody back here at 1015. All right, hello everybody, we're back. Uh, first thing we'll do is uh, we had a request to go through the um, uh, quizzes. So we'll go through, or excuse me, the chapter five quiz. Uh, so let me get that up here in front of me, or I shouldn't say in front of us. Okay, so we'll head to chapter five quiz and uh, talk about that, you know, quizzes are always good to go through. I uh, apologize, I forgot that. I was kind of getting caught up on uh, the problems there, but uh, they're always good to go through because it um, really has a lot of the topics that are uh, the most important or most pertinent to the, uh, uh, the, um, the subject of the chapter here. So we got chapter five quiz. Uh, number one states that if the taxpayer does not have a qualifying child for the earned income credit, which one of the statements is true. Uh, that's where we go to that age that we talked about. The taxpayer must be at least 25 and under 65, okay? Um, question two, which statement does not meet rule 14 concerning the earned income credit, uh, the requirement for a taxpayer without a qualifying child, okay? And it says rule 14 there, the taxpayer must have lived in the US for more than half a year. Uh, we have uh, letter D, the taxpayer lived in Puerto Rico for over half the year, okay? Um, the one for here on chapter, excuse me, question three in chapter five, uh, the taxpayer's child must meet three tests to be a qualifying child for EIC. Which statement below is not one of these three tests? Uh, it is D, must be under 13. Um, after we do a few more of the credits, um, I'll make sure I, I am making one up for uh, at the request of some of my classroom sessions, and I will make up, um, you know, something for you guys uh, that kind of has the little tiers. You know, when when a child is a certain age, you know, what credit is either on the table or off the table. Uh, so what credit they may be eligible for, or what credit they may not be eligible for. Uh, good example, I'm going to throw in a little thing here about the New York State. Uh, the child tax credit uh, in New York State uh, is a refundable credit on the New York return on uh, the, the uh, New York IT 201 page four. Your child is not eligible for that until the year they turn four. So for the first three years of their life in the state of New York, your child does not exist on your tax return for a credit. Why that is the case, I do not know. I don't know what the thought process is there, but all I know is uh, when they turn four, you get a credit for. Them. Now, granted, they're an exemption on the return, but they're not a credit. So I guess uh, New York has determined that uh, first three years of their life, you have absolutely no expenses for them. So you don't need the credit. All right. Okay. So um, that was, sorry, I got off of my, out of my soapbox. That was my editorial for the day. Um, Question four, what statement is false concerning EIC, okay? And it's letter A, the taxpayer must have a qualifying child. 
uh, when we went through the one exercise that talked about the, you know, the income and the, the thresholds and things like that and what that earned income credit is. As we stated, you know, if your income is below a certain level or in a certain range, uh, you're eligible for the EIC even though you may not have any qualifying child, okay? All right, uh, number five, um, you know, we won't really go through that one specific. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot there, but uh, you know, the big thing is um, just knowing all the seven rules that you, and personally, it should be in bold letters, underlined, maybe in all caps, must meet in order to get earned income credit. It's not that you can get one and you know, you get to pass go and collect your $200 for the earned income credit. Um, you must meet all of these in order to be eligible, okay? So, you know, make sure you understand all those. The AGI, um, Social Security numbers, you know, I run into instances, uh, I have several clients that are foster parents um, and or uh, have adopted kids or whatever it may be, and, and sometimes we run in a tough situation with Social Security numbers. Uh, the previous parents maybe haven't released it. We have items. Uh, we have to go through some things, and, you know, there's a whole other can of worms that opens up, but you know, must have that social security number. Um, again, they can't file separate. You know, you can't do the married filing separate. Uh, they must be a uh, US citizen. Um, you cannot have foreign earned income. So you cannot have a uh, you know, form where you're doing, you know, even though it is earned income, it cannot be foreign. Uh, the big one I talked about with the scenarios is that investment income, that $3,500 threshold. And like I said, you know, it could be traditional sense of what we think investment income to be, or it can be in that alternative sense where it is income from a rental property. You're living in a duplex and you rent out half of it. Or say that, uh, you know, your income's lower, but, uh, you know, your family has land down in the southern tier and you rent it for hunting, um, you know, and you get, uh, you know, because, you know, you have low property taxes and you get this money that you should be declaring. Uh, from renting it uh, out to hunting or whatever it may be, you know, if that's investment income and it's over 3,500, then the earned income credit's off the table. And thus, the last one, number seven, I'm going to say, is you must have earned income, okay? I get a lot of clients, they'll do their returns, and, you know, obviously this credit helps people that are maybe, you know, in a rough way or, you know, having a tough time and helps them out, but, you know, the money that they make from unemployment, that is not earned income. I realize that, you know, it's, it's part of their compensation or if they're a seasonal employee where they're laid off and collecting unemployment, but it, it doesn't count towards their earned income. So it doesn't count towards the earned income credit, okay? Uh, question six, which is false about the additional child tax credit, okay? Um, it's letter B, the additional child tax credit is a non-refundable credit, okay? The child tax credit is a non-refundable, and we're going to be talking about that today. But the additional child tax credit is a refundable, okay? So there's portions of it that you get no matter what. Uh, question seven, the refundable portion of the American Opportunity Tax Credit is a maximum of 40%, okay? So that's how much of that American Opportunity. And again, you know, what we do today with the... Um, uh, the uh, other the two chapters that we're going to cover, um, you know, kind of works well with what we did on five. You know, chapter five, six, and seven have a lot of overlapping pieces uh, because there are credits, uh, just like the child tax credit, additional child tax credit that overlap with each other. Uh, the American Opportunity, where it has refundable and non-refundable portions, things like that. So, you know, a lot of the chapters uh, kind of overlap on things. Okay. Uh, question eight, which is false about the credit for excess social security tax and railroad tax withheld, okay? And that one is, uh, let's see, C. The credit can be claimed if the overwithholding occurred by one employer. Remember, if you have excess social security taken out of your pay and you only have one employer, okay, you have to go to that employer to get your money back because they took too much money. If you have two, okay, two employers or more, then you do it on the tax return because it may be the case that one employer and the other employer did not know what each other was doing. So that's where, you know, that's on the tax return. So one employer, okay, one employer makes a mistake, you got to take it up with the employer. Two or more, all right, 
you do it on the tax return. And I always use the example, maybe we have a doctor that works for two hospitals that are unrelated to each other. You know, he makes 100,000 at each hospital. We know that $128,400 is the maximum. Well, obviously, you know, he's over that. And that just means that chances are he's gonna have too much social security tax withheld and Medicare and, you know, so he has to file that on the return, okay? All right, and question nine, which is false about the credit, oh, I'm sorry, question nine, I'm not there. Which is false about the credit for tax on undistributed capital gains, okay? The credit applies to stocks, letter A, okay? Um, not gonna spend a lot of time, like I said, when I went through the chapter, I didn't spend a lot of time on it. Um, I come back to this and we talk about it more uh, when we get to the chapter that talks about capital gains. Uh, because, you know, again, it's a credit, but I'd much rather keep it in the content with where, you know, capital gains is talked about and how those things go about, okay? And the last one, uh, which is false about the health coverage tax credit, um, that one is B, the employer is limited to paying 50% of the premiums. Um, can't stress enough that when we talk about the health coverage tax credit, that is different from the advanced or the premium tax credit, okay? That advanced or premium tax credit, that's the one you hear about from the Affordable Care Act, the New York State of Health. People have income levels or thresholds where they get help from the federal government um, in the form of a credit either to pay their monthly insurance or they can get it on the, the tax return at the end. And again, we'll cover uh, reconciling that in a later chapter but uh, it is much different from the health coverage tax credit. Um, the health coverage tax credit is something that you'll see more often uh, for somebody, and, and the best example is uh, you know, somebody that maybe is a manufacturing job in this area, their business closed here because they shipped the job overseas. And you know, as part of the retraining for them to be able to develop a skill that allows them to do something else in manufacturing, you know, rather than the skill that they had, then they get to do that and then they get to uh, take that uh, credit while they're paying for their health insurance. So, you know, you see it, but it's not as prevalent as what we see with the uh, Affordable Care Act in that premium tax credit, okay? All right, and as promised, I'm gonna go take a look. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, the Van Eatons, okay? Uh, this is problem, let me get on my other screen here. Uh, again, this is uh, page um, 510 in your workbook. Uh, it's, uh, it's problem 5-2, but it's uh, page, uh, like I said, 510, okay? All right, uh, bullet points from this one. We had George and Jean file a 1040. Um, they were able to itemize, okay? Well, again, light should go off from what we talked about. <coughs> Excuse me. What we talked about and the fact that um, we have, um, you know, the um, uh, a possibility of a refund maybe from the previous year that would be taxable. So, again, we're going to take a look, and they, sure enough, they had a state refund of $287. Uh, that we need to have um, taxed. Um, if they get a refund, they'd like to put in their checking account. Uh, we use the main information sheet um, to put the information. They have a daughter, Amy, who is in her third year at Buff State. And uh, oddly enough, it makes a statement that says, Amy has never been convicted of a felony for possession or distribution of a controlled substance. Um, Gonna tell a quick, well, uh, I'll wait to it. We'll go to it later. I got, I got a good story for you on that one. So I, I know, I hope you guys don't get bored with my stories, but I like to interject a little bit of that just to break up the monotony. Um, neither George nor Jean were full-time or received distribution from a retirement plan in the last three years. Again, Form 8880, uh, that, sh that um, savers credit, okay? Uh, no EIC was disallowed and the Eaton family had health coverage for the entire year, okay? So if we look on here, we have our information. Uh, we did everything, uh, George and Jean. George is working as a manager um, and Jean is a hostess, okay? So we had that. Uh, married filing joint. Uh, we have their daughter, Amy, okay? 
I have her information in there. She, uh, even though it was in college, she lived with them. And uh, I like to check the EIC box here. Uh, so remember these columns are DC is for dependent credit. And we'll talk about that today. Uh, EIC is for the earned income credit. Um, I always like to check that because again, I don't want that left on the table where I can't get it. And then in this case, uh, because uh, Amy is 20, um, she does not qualify for the child tax credit because she has passed her 16th birthday. Um, but now there's a new credit in 18 that was the other dependent credit. And that is a um, $500 credit. So you can see she qualifies for that. Okay. Again, they were going to pause in the checking. You know, most all this, the main info sheets, um, you know, putting in the, the, the zip code, um, the dates, all the things like that. We have that. Um, and all our information there, okay? All right, so first thing we're gonna take a look at is uh, that first bullet says that George and Jean filed a 1040 last year. They were able to itemize and they received a $287 refund. Again, because they did itemize, all right, that uh, refund is taxable, okay? So what we have to take a look at, schedule one, we have our question, did you itemize deductions last year and receive a state or local refund? The answer is yes. That will make the line, or excuse me, the box on line 10 light up. Now I realize I tend to have you hit F9 and, and go to these um, worksheets to use them to calculate things to make sure that the numbers are done correctly. Um, in this case, it is not a worksheet that works very well because we have no history. Um, if you have taken a look at that, there's uh, no history on there for previous year's return because for the Van Eaton, so we just have to, to put that refund in there, okay? Now, on this, um, if we have um, a situation where somebody receives a refund, okay, and they receive, we're gonna say, a $1,030 refund, okay? If they receive that refund and part of that refund was a $330, okay? So we got a $1,030 refund and they received a $330 child tax credit on their return, all right? What we do is we back that out, okay? They are not going to charge tax on a refundable credit for New York on the federal, okay? So that means instead of reporting that 1,030, we subtract the $330 uh, Empire Child Tax Credit, and we would only put $700 on there, okay? Um, the worksheet doesn't work very well for that. That's something that you just need to make note of and have knowledge of, okay? That you back out that $330, all right? Uh, I know one of the problems has that uh, that's in here, but uh, you know we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about it, but that's something from the uh, New York State um, or excuse me, the federal that we need to know about the New York State with the Empire Child Tax Credit, okay? So in that case, we have that on there, all right? Um, let's see here. Uh, hold on one second. Okay. All right. So we have that. Okay. All right. So we have that in there. Now, from the, uh, the book on page 512, we have George. Um, he's working for a sub delivery company. He has his income. He, we put it in there. We have his withholding. Um, as we can see down here, we talked about it on a previous problem. In box 12, he contributed $2,000 to his retirement, a 401k. Um, in 13, we check his box there for his uh, retirement plan. And uh, we have nothing here. Um, just as a point of note, I think I sent out the keyboard shortcuts to everybody. On 14, a lot of times that box for the amount uh, becomes, uh, um, becomes um, 
red, we just hit F3 and, and uh, go right back to that, okay? All right, and actually give me one second here. I just gotta take care of something real quick. Okay, apologize about that. Uh, we're having a little fall festival for all our employees here, a little Halloween thing, and somebody was knocking on my door to uh, see if they uh, they uh, needed some help with something. So, all right. So, uh, as I said, we have uh, George in here, and we had his uh, contributions to retirement. Um, you can see over on the left um, there that that eighty-eight eighty again lit up. Okay, so that means that they're gonna be getting a credit. Um, real quick, we'll take a look at uh, Jean's um, W-2 that is in there. Uh, we have that in there with her income, her withholding, same thing. She's making some contrib contributions to a retirement account um, and the retirement plan there. And on this one, we have uh, state tax withholding, okay? So between the two of them, we can see their contributions here, and it says from their W-2, um, they were not full-time students, all right? And uh, again, with this, you can see the F3, that little sheet that I sent to you uh, that has the shortcuts, I can hit F3 in there. And when I do hit F3, um, I like to call it the Visine button. It gets the red out, okay? So we have that. So we have their W-2s in there, and we got their contributions to the retirement. And uh, sure enough, with them putting that in there, that's a nice $300 credit. Again, kind of a win, win, win all the way around. We had their taxable income be lower that we saw in the W-2 because we can see box one is less than box three. So that was lowered. Uh, we have them putting money into their retirement. Uh, there's a good chance that they're possibly getting matching there. And then the third thing is they got a $300 credit towards their tax bill on their tax return. So obviously a very good situation for them, okay? Now, the last tax document we have here for the Van Eatons is we talked about their daughter, Amy. Uh, their daughter, Amy, is a college student. Uh, so we gotta make sure that we go in there and have that in there for them, okay? Now, used to be it was a lot easier when there was just two pages to the 1040 and everything flowed to that. Um, in this day and age, they've decided to make the postcard and then they're doing all these uh, you know, little schedules. So sometimes, you know, when we go to the 1040, we know that it's a credit, uh, there's portions in there, but you know, we just can't find it. Um, what I've been teaching my students to do, and I, I think it works well, is that when we start out, we have a uh, schedule, one, take a look at it. You know, these are the things that have where all these things flow to. And we look here, we got incomes and adjustments income. You know, not really there, that's a credit. Uh, we hit schedule two, it's titled tax. Well, it's not a tax, we got a credit. We get to three, non-refundable credits. Hmm, we got some credits. If we look down here in line 50, education credits, there we go. 
Amy is a college student and uh, this is that American Opportunity Education Credit that we have, okay? So we're gonna use that. And seeing that it says that we have a form 8863, that means that that number must come from a form. So we go over, we light our tree up, excuse me, light our box up, hit F9. Sure enough, there we go. We have an education credit form, all right? So we go to that form and we start to complete it. You know, you'll have red on this, okay? So we have it. Students' names, okay? Social Security number. Uh, she went to Buff State according to her 1098T. Uh, we answer the questions. Did the student receive a 1098T from this institution? We answer yes, okay? And do we receive a 1098T from the institution with box two, uh, two fill, or excuse me, 2017 with box two filled and box seven checked? In this case, no. Um, what happens is that college students, when they have four years of college, what really happens is there's five tax years in play, okay? Because it starts out with the fall of their freshman year and ends with the spring of their fourth year. So that falls into five tax years. The American Opportunity Credit is only available for the first four years, okay? So that means that last year is not eligible for it. So it's very important, okay? We get tons of letters or help people out where by accident they take a fifth year and then have to pay back because they get, you know, don't get that, okay? Now, that box seven, as it states there, says check if the amount in box one includes amounts for any academic period beginning January through March 2019. Again, the spring semester, okay? But in this case, we don't have anything like that, okay? So we have that. We put in the EIN number of the institution. Okay, uh, there is a second space, you know, if somebody went uh, the spring semester to one school and the fall semester to another, that was where they would do that. Okay, all right. Okay, so we have that. Um, we have, we have that, all right, and All right, okay, you wanna come over and say hi? I'm teaching on the computer. Can you wave in there? Can you see they see your little box? There you go, okay. Wave at him again, say hi. She asleep? No, she was not real, she was yeah. hi, and then we got a little couple All right, we her. just got some guests here. These are our guest lecturers, okay. Grandson and granddaughter here for the party, so, okay. All right. All right. So sorry for the interruption, but uh, that little dessert. Okay. All right. So now, when we get to the bottom of our um, tax form, okay, we have lines 23, 24, 25, and 26. This is kind of our due diligence that we have to do for the, the scholarship. So the first question we have is, is the HOPE Scholarship Credit or American Opportunity Credits um, been claimed for any four tax years? Remember I said, somebody's four year academic career can fall into five tax years, but in this case we have four, okay? Was, uh, and, and this case uh, from the bullet points, I believe it said that she was in her third year as a full-time student above state. So again, you know, four years, she's got that first three going, okay? So we have that. Uh, was the student enrolled at least half time? Um, again, from our 1098T, uh, we can see that it says there that uh, box eight, check if at least half time student, it's checked. So we can answer yes. Uh, did the student complete the first four years of post-secondary education? Well, we know she's not graduated by the statement again from the bullet point, so we have no, okay? All right, okay. And then we have uh, line six. This is where the bullet point comes in. Was the student convicted before the end of 2018 of a felony for possession or distribution of a controlled substance? Oh, we got some chat here, hold on. Okay. 
All right, I'll get to those in just a second here that the chat's not coming up on my shared screen, okay? So I'll come back to them in just a second. Um, my story on this one, I had a young lady, uh, she was actually filing by herself. Um, her parents were no longer alive, but, uh, and I, I've been doing a return for a while and she decided to go to college. And uh, she came in and, and she had a friend with her. And that friend was uh, sitting in the waiting room with her and was on her phone and uh, just doing some things and going back and forth and stuff. And I sat down with the client and, you know, it was all right with her that her friend was there. And we went through and, you know, I talked to her, but it's great you're going back to college and such. And so we went through all that and I had to do my due diligence. And I asked the young lady that was my client that I was preparing the return. I said, uh, and the last question is, have you ever been convicted for the felony for possession or distribution of a controlled substance? She answered no. And again, her friend sitting there in the cubicle with me in my office and uh, her friend piped up and said, well, what about last summer when you got caught in that car with those two? And sure enough, her friend threw her under the bus and, uh, you know, she had been convicted, um, you know, for a, a felony possession uh, due to circumstances. And, you know, she gathered up her papers and left. And, you know, sad to say, I never saw her again. I, I you know, I, was, I had worked with her for several years, but, you know, I'm sure that she may have gone down the street and probably left her friend in the car, uh, to say the least. But that's a situation, you know, where you have to do your due diligence and, as soon as something like that is disclosed, I mean, you as a tax preparer for your credentials, you know, you just can't answer that. And as soon as I answer yes to that, you know, that American Opportunity credit is off the table. Um, you know, it, it's a very good credit and, and, you know, you hate to have a young lady in that situation loses it, but, you know, that's just kind of the nature of things. But I guess the moral of the story is, is if you have your friend with you when you're doing your tax return and there's something that you don't want disclosed, leave her in the waiting room. Don't bring her in with you, okay? All right, so we go down, and again, we're on the American Opportunity Credit. We have uh, 27 is the Adjusted Qualified Education Expenses. 1098 Ts are never done accurately. They're just not done correctly, okay? I, I don't know any other way to say this, but they're just not done correctly. Um, the schools don't fill them out correctly, okay? Um, the, the IRS has, has gotten onto it a little bit more so that they're working harder with the schools to get them to do the correct, uh, filling out these forms. Uh, box one and two get mixed up. Things in box five that maybe student loans are in there versus scholarships and things like that. So, you know, again, I stress to my clients and, and they've gotten good about doing it if they have college students that I have them bring in what's called the statement of student account. It is a, an, a, basically it looks like the bank statement for their, their tuition. Um, they can get it off the student portal. A lot of times parents are calling when I'm sitting with them and they're having them send screenshots of it. Um, it shows tuition billed. How was it paid? You know, it was paid by credit card. It was paid by cash or by a check or it was paid uh, with student loans. It shows in scholarships. It shows that, you know, credit and debit, you know, positive and negatives or whatever you want to call it going back and forth. Okay, so that's where you get that. And that's the best way if you're unsure and you ask them, hey, did you only pay $2,000 out of pocket? Well, no, we paid a lot more. Well, you know, you need something more than what the 1098T shows to justify that. Okay, now when we do put in this down there, box one for Amy says $8,214. Box five shows that she got $6,000 in scholarships. All right, what that means is we have to subtract that $6,000 from that 8214, okay? That leaves us, as you see here, 2214. So that's what they get credit for. That is their true out-of-pocket qualified education expenses. And again, qualified education expenses do not include room and board, okay? And we'll talk more about that, all right? And as it says on here, if we did not have that scholarship, on Amy's 1098T, we could only put a maximum of 4,000 in there, all right? Now, one thing I'm gonna point out here procedurally for you, as soon as you do an education credit on a tax return, all right, one thing I want you to remember to do is go immediately to the state. There is a state education credit, 
okay? Now, what I mean by that is that right now, if I look at my tree on the left, New York, I don't see anything, okay? Again, out of sight, out of mind. New York does that a lot. Hiding way down here at the bottom is our New York 272. As soon as you do that uh, federal uh, American Opportunity Credit, we will have that there. We go to it, we answer the questions that uh, chances are lit up in red. Uh, we complete the information that is in green that we need to put in for Amy's uh, date of birth, okay? We have our tuition, again, only qualified expenses, all right? Make sure that those are that, and that way we complete that for the education credit. Now, page two of the New York 272, and again, this is a little New York State considerations. On page two, there is this question eight. On the state of New York, you can take uh, education expenses, qualified education expenses. You can take them either as a itemized deduction or a tuition credit, okay? So that being said, we have a, cho a choice here with these to we can choose between two, all right? I, if I choose it and check this box as an itemized deduction, you can see it diminished my return, okay? If I take it as a tuition credit, it increases my uh, return or refund, okay? If somebody's going to a very high tuition, possibly a private institution, or they're paying a lot of money out of pocket, sometimes it's the case it's better to take it as an itemized deduction, all right? So that's where we want to make sure that we understand that we can do this comparison, all right? Uh, it doesn't matter that you took it as a credit on the federal, it doesn't mean you have to take it as a as a credit on the state. But what I'm saying is, is that, you know, if you have somebody that has a very high number, you know, you can see here, I could enter a number, but then it takes a maximum of 10,000. If this number up here was $17,000, then what I would do is I would definitely check to see if I could take it as an itemized deduction. And, you know, the farther we get in and we do some things with itemization, um, I'm gonna show you both how the federal and the state work so you can see how that impact would be different um, between the two scenarios, okay? All right, so that's problem five two, okay? That was the, uh, our, our Van Eaton plan, okay? Um, let's see here, we won't do anything with five three. I'm gonna talk about that when I do something else on there, okay? All right, so we have, okay, let's see here. Ba, 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 Judy, still not clear on line 23. Um, line 23 of that 8863, that's that one that uh, the first four years. Um, let me do this. Hold on one second. I'm going to make something up here. Give me one second and we'll see if we can do this. Okay, maybe this will clear up the box 23. Let me just kind of do this. I uh, apologize, I don't have a place to draw on, but uh, okay. So if you take a look at what I did here, if somebody started in the fall of 2019, these are the academic years for a four-year degree, okay? I put a box in, these are my four tax years that I can use it in. As you can see down here, we have that extra floater year making a fifth tax year. If I have in, or excuse me, I have qualified tuition expenses from that, we're gonna to learn the, today about the lifetime learning credit, and I paid those in 2023, then that's a different credit. I can only take that American opportunity in those first four years, 
okay? So, you know, that's where, like I said, you know, you don't want somebody trying to take it a fifth year, okay? So that's where that comes into play. All right, I hope that clears up that uh, line 23 thing. It's, uh, it's important. Um, it's something that we got to make sure that we get in there. Okay. All right. Let's see here. So what we're going to do is we're going to move on and we're going to do chapter six and seven. And trust me, this will go by very quickly so that we can spend some more time in the problems. Uh, let me see. here. There we go. Okay. All right. Chapter six. Okay. Chapter six, uh, what these are, these are non-refundable credits. And for those that were here last time, um, if you remember um, what uh, non-refundable credits, well, what refundable credits are, I used refundable credits in the term I used, and like everybody remember, Mez, those are the Energizer Bunny, all right? And if we remember the uh, commercial, they go on and on and on and on forever. Okay, what that means is that even though our tax bill may disappear, our credit will be going on. Okay, when we talk about non refundable credits, and I hope I'm not dating myself, but uh, seeing that we're in kind of a somewhat of a retro age, um, the non refundable credits are a Pac Man. All right, what I mean by that, if you remember the Pac Man game, you know, the little credits, the little guys eating up the dots, those are our tax bill. But once the dots are gone, the Pac-Man stops, okay? Those are non-refundable credits. Basically what I'm saying is they eat up the tax bill, but once the tax bill is gone, they stop, okay? That's something important. So that's why when I say that we had a lot of overlap with that child tax credit and American Opportunity Credit, we wanna make sure that, that we understand that, okay? All right, so in this chapter, we're going to, if we go to page, let's see here, I'm on page 6-3. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, the child tax credit and the credit for other dependents. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the foreign tax credit. And then we're gonna talk about uh, the American opportunity, which we did in the refundable portion, but we're also gonna talk about it in the non-refundable portion. And we're gonna talk about the lifetime learning credit, okay? And how to report all these, all right? Okay, child tax credit, okay? Um, this little part at the top, um, this is a great thing um, that we have that, um, you know, that we have on there. Um, what this is, it's a great way that uh, helps you navigate. Uh, remember I've said that navigate one way or the other, um, you know, the child tax credit uh, for other dependents, um, you know, that's where we have, you know, go to line, you know, 1040, 12A, Foreign tax credit, you can see, well, we need to go to schedule three, line 48, American opportunity, we just saw that, schedule three, lifetime learning in the form. So these are great little, uh, with helps on those, so, okay. Excuse me one second. Okay, just want to make sure you guys can hear the recording, all right? So I just had a little activity outside the door there. All right, child tax credit and credit for the other dependents. Um, prior to 2018, the child tax credit was a $1,000 credit, okay? Which was great, you know, granted you can't raise a kid for a thousand bucks, but it was a credit that you got on your tax return. Uh, in 2018, under the new tax laws, that child tax credit moved to $2,000 with $1,400 refundable, okay? So a great credit. Um, there also, once your child turned 17, it used to be, hey, they weren't a credit on the return. You used to get the exemptions, but exemptions disappeared. So you didn't get that $4,000 for them, okay? So we have that, and with the additional child tax credit, okay? With the additional child, or the uh, credit for the other dependents, um, we had all of a sudden, with the exemption gone, they put a $500 credit on the table. And again, it is other dependents. It doesn't have to be a child. 
we talked about that worksheet that we did uh, back in the earlier chapters where we said, hey, can I put mom on the return? Well, you know, it used to be again, it was for an exemption, but now that's not the case. It's on there for a credit, okay? All right, the other thing that's great about the credit now is you got $2,000 instead of 1,000 is the income phase out. It used to be the child tax credit. If you had somebody that had income, married filing joint income, and it was in excess of $120,000, then what would happen is that that in, uh, child tax credit would phase out. Um, I always tell all my students that the phase out, um, to use again, I hope I'm not dating myself, but if you think about the old uh, Back to the Future and Michael J. Fox, he always had the picture of his family, and as things happened, they just started to fade away. Same thing happens with the taxes. Uh, when you hear about a phase out, that means the income level gets to such a way that all of a sudden it starts to disappear, okay? Well, what they did with the phase out, instead of that 100,000, 125,000 range, now it's 400,000. That's a lot of money for a household married filing joint. That being said, that means that a lot more people are able to keep this child tax credit or other dependent credit. Um, even single, head of household, and married filing separate. $200,000, that's a lot of money. And even on the married filing separate, they can keep this child tax credit or other dependent credit, okay? So it's a very good credit that's on the table there, all right? Um, child tax credit, again, I always talk about, as soon as you see that word qualifying, when you see qualifying, you know that means there's gotta be some test. It must mean must or test or something that has to be met for you to be eligible for that credit. Well, when we do that and we look at it here, we see that we got our seven tests for a qualifying child must be met for the purpose of the child tax credit. You know, we talk about the child being of the relationship under age 17, did not provide over half of his or her own support, lived with the taxpayer for more than half of the year, um, is claimed as a dependent. Um, there are some exceptions. And again, that would be, you know, different things that uh, would, would have them not living in the house, but there are those exceptions that consider them still for the purpose of the child tax credit on return that they, they can still be on there, okay? Um, does not file a joint return for the year and was a US citizen and US national or whatever that may be. So again, those are where those are in there, okay? Uh, adopted child can be considered, you know, foster child can also be considered uh, for the child tax credit, okay? So you have a lot of different things that are there for that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the credit for the other dependent credit, uh, again, a very good credit. Um, you know, it's, it, it's kind of an offset, as I said, because exemptions disappear. That $4,050 used to get for each person in the household to reduce your gross income or taxable income, okay? Since they took those away, this was kind of the bone they throw to everybody and gave you that credit, okay? All right. Now, next thing we're gonna go through is, oops, hold on one second, let me get down here, okay? And again, well, I kind of skip over these forms. These are exercises for you. Uh, just want you understanding where the calculations go. Uh, the big thing I want you to pay attention is, you know, most of them have, you know, caution, you know, you have to meet all of this before you can proceed. You know, those are those things that help you develop those questions and, and, and interview skills uh, to help you, you know, be able to determine if they're eligible for this credit um, or not uh, and, and how that credit and uh, different things that are on their tax for return would be impacted. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Did I remember to send to you guys? I will put them in there. Okay, um, well, let me see, I can get one here. Give me one second. Okay, so I'm gonna show you something real quick. All right, let me just get something open here real quick. Uh, something I handed out and I'll make sure that it is in the drop box. Uh, 
shift. Okay. All right, so what I'll put in the Dropbox, this is uh, from uh, somebody that uh, we had that um, I use for an example that has uh, from their brokerage account. And up in the corner here, you can see, and I apologize that it's sideways. Um, I've tried to get it rotated and, and, and haven't gotten it to, to work the way it should. Uh, but on here, you can see that this is a 1099 DIV, okay? If you look at line seven, there is foreign tax paid, $7.96. What that is, that $7.96, that means this individual has a brokerage account, investments, um, that they are paying tax in a foreign country. Well, they get a credit for that. That's where they get that, that credit, okay? So that's where you'll see it, <coughs> excuse me, quite often, is that you'll see that foreign tax credit um, in that method, okay? Uh, ba, ba, ba. Okay. Um, the other thing that we'll see with the foreign tax credit is uh, somebody that's truly that. Um, I worked uh, Friday with somebody that's a client of mine in England. I have a few that are over there. I just, very similar to what I'm doing with you right here. Um, I do their tax return through this. Uh, I have a client in Dubai, I got somebody in Germany, South Africa. Um, so, you know, Clients that uh, I do, they're U.S. citizens, and seeing that they're U.S. citizens, they still need to file a tax return in the United States, even though they are living abroad and earning income over there. Well, they get credits for foreign earned income, plus they also get this foreign tax credit, because if they're paying tax in a foreign country, our country is not going to tax that money again and have it taxed twice. Uh, so they would get that with uh, the foreign tax, okay? And as you can see here, there are foreign earned income exclusions. So most of their income is excluded and we don't have to worry about taking this credit. But if we have a small tax bill that maybe shows up from something, say they're living abroad, but they have some investments uh, that are here in the States, um, you know, then we can try to, you know, minimize that tax by using the foreign tax credit uh, that they get uh, against uh, what they would pay on tax that they have here, okay? All right, so that's where you see that foreign tax come into play. All right, now, I realize the remainder of chapter six, there's a lot of stuff, and I know when I do my classroom sessions, um, they get uh, overwhelmed by the stuff that is in chapter six, some of it was in five, uh, the education credits, um, but, you know, this is really, this is the meat and potatoes of the whole thing, okay? So on this, we have really what, what we need to take a look at, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna cover the American Opportunity Credit, okay? Um, as it says here, it is a credit uh, up to $2,500 per eligible student. So, you know, if those of you that have two or three in college and, and they're falling within this credit, obviously a very good credit on it. Uh, I talked about a phase out when we were talking about the child tax credit. You can see here on this one that we have a limited on their uh, modified adjusted gross income. Um, if a married family is making more than 180,000 or 90,000 for single head of household, um, you know, then, you know, you, you can uh, take this credit, um, you know, and it, but its chances are it's going to start to phase out and will eventually disappear. Um, it is a refundable credit, as we talked about, we had in that quiz last, uh, last time for chapter five, 40% of the credit may be refundable, um, available, and again, big black letters only for the first four years. Uh, number of tax years credit available, again, only four years. Um, type of program, the student must be pursuing a program leading to a degree or other recognized educational credential. Um, sometimes people don't realize that, uh, you know, the cosmetology schools, a lot of them in this area are such that they have um, business classes so that when they're running their salon or their studio or whatever you want to call it, that they understand the business side of it, not just the side that they have that they learn at the cosmetology school with the hair or whatever it may be. 
So that being said, you know, those schools can also qualify, but they have to be leading towards a program. And some of those schools do have accreditation for that, okay? Student must be enrolled at least half time or at least one academic period during the year. Um, again, half time student. Um, we don't run across the problem with that very often anymore in New York, because if anybody's qualifying for the Excelsior scholarship, you know, they have to have at least those 30 credit hours to remain eligible for that Excelsior credit. And, uh, you know, so most people are enrolled, uh, you know, as a full time, not, you know, as a half time student. Talked about the felony drug conviction. Um, again, nobody can have that felony drug conviction. Uh, qualified expenses, uh, tuition, enrollment fees, course materials that the student needs for a course of study, whether or not the materials are, brought, are bought at the educational institution as a condition of enrollment or attendance, okay? Um, first thing that always comes up with this, and people always ask, computers, um, you know, computer for college. Yes, those are qualified education expenses. You know, it used to be kind of a little bit iffy, but those are qualified education expenses. And what I mean by that is that um, now, you know, professors, you have to mail in your exam or go online or, you know, textbooks. A lot of times you're not buying a textbook anymore. You buy a little access card that gives you a little number so you can go online and get the electronic book. Well, you know, most of the time that makes the computer almost mandatory. Um, for them so that we have to have that. The sense of it really used to be if I'm an art student and I have to buy brushes, charcoal pencils, sketchbooks, you know, whatever it may be to complete my, my course of study, you know, those are qualified education expenses, okay? Uh, payments for academic periods, payments made in 2018 for academic periods. Again, we have to understand that we're on the cash basis. So when does the dollar change hands? If we paid for it in 2018, even though it may be for things beginning in 2019, it is a credit in 2018, okay? Cash basis, follow the dollar when it changes hands. Um, talks about uh, filers and students must have a tax ID number and educational institutions, we have to have that, okay? Now, we're gonna talk a little bit about, okay? Now we have the lifetime learning credit, okay? This is a credit that's up to $2,000, non-refundable credit, okay? Uh, again, you see the phase outs, a little lower than what we saw with the American Opportunity. Uh, it is a non-refundable, okay? Uh, that means it can only eat up our tax bill. Once it's done with that, we're done. It's not like the American Opportunity where we can get a refundable portion. Available for all years of post-secondary education. Well, thus the name, Lifetime Learning. This is where we start to see those uh, you know, credits for people. Hey, I'm taking a course working on my master's or whatever it may be, okay? Um, available for an unlimited number of tax years. Student does not need to be pursuing a program leading to a degree, all right? And available for one course or more. This is sometimes where I'll see people that are trying to advance their accreditation. Um, I have several clients that are in uh, at the Niagara or NCCC in their culinary program, you know, and they're taking those classes to, to broaden their skill set for different things they have for being a chef or cook or whatever it may be, uh, or a baker, you know, they're trying to learn some different things. So this is where that lifetime learning credit could come into play. Um, we do not have to worry about our felony drug convictions. Uh, so for those of you, I'm not going to ask you to disclose your names, but for those of you that maybe have a little bit of a sordid pass, there is hope for you. You still get this credit, okay? Uh, tuition and uh, enrollment fees, again, everything we pretty much saw with the American Opportunity Credit, okay? All right, so we have that, okay? All right, and like I said, I realize that the, you know, the next few pages, you know, we're on 618, you know, all the way through, you know, basically six, and a great little flow chart, uh, but all the way through is all of the credits that talk about education and all the different things that I talked about there. And again, all very good material. Just make sure you understand all of them. That little box pretty much, you know, sums it up and everything that you need to know as far as the, uh, the, the non-refundable portion of that, 
Okay. All right. Uh, again, a lot of forms, fill them out, you know, the due diligence, a lot of exercises uh, with scenarios, make sure you're understanding those. Uh, as it shows with this one here, um, you know, we have one scholarships subtracting that uh, from the payments in box one. And then now at the bottom, we got Thomas here, but we got a note, check for graduate student. So those are something that, uh, you know, we have to know that's going to go for the lifetime learning. We cannot use that for the American opportunity. Okay. All right. Okay, so that covers chapter six. All right. Uh, what we'll do here, um, we have just a few that we're going to do here that'll go pretty quick. Um, and so what we'll do is, let's see, it is, I have 1118. Uh, we'll come back at 1130. I'll go through these credits real quick. Uh, we'll do a, some more problems and then uh, we'll be able to wrap it up for the day. Okay. All right. All right. So again, uh, we'll say 1130. That gives us about 10 minutes. Um, I can go warm my coffee up that's gotten cold and then uh, we'll continue on from there. And like I said, chapter seven, again, real quick, but we'll talk more about these a little bit more in depth. Uh, we're going to doing some of the problems and the examples. So we'll see you in 10 minutes, guys. All right, everybody, uh, welcome back. We're in the home stretch today. Um, I know we're covering a lot, um, you know, but we just have this time together. Again, um, you know, I recorded these, I sent them out to everybody. I hope you get a chance. Uh, I know from uh, our YouTube channel, um, you know, I, I know that uh, uh, I think it's still the case that if you subscribe to it, uh, once I post things, you'll know when they go up there. Um, you know, that, that, that are on there. And, and I hope that these are a help uh, when you go back to do the homework and review and things like that. Um, so, you know, make sure that uh, we have that on there, that, uh, you know, you have those. And as I've said in the past too, um, you know, it's gonna get easier as far as uh, the computer. Um, you'll be doing things and we'll just be adding little things to it with new forms, but, you know, you'll start to understand the navigation of it and uh, know what to do. Um, so it'll get easier than that. You know, uh, you're probably already feeling like you can do that main info page, I hope, in your sleep. Um, you know, I, I kind of start to feel that way when I'm doing, you know, my thousand or whatever, how many I lose track, you know, how many tax returns I do during a tax season. But, uh, you know, you start to kind of do those in your sleep. And, but, uh, you know, want you just to make sure that you understand the stuff that we're covering and we're, we're delving into it pretty deep is a lot of the basic stuff that you're going to see most common on tax returns, individual tax returns. Um, those things are the most important that you need to make sure that you, you know, understand and, you know, that stuff, you know, I'm kind of when we're going through these, it may sound like I'm kind of a broken record, but I really want to make sure that you, you understand all these. Okay. All right. So we're going to hit chapter seven. Um, this is where, let's see, where'd my chapter seven go? There it is. Okay. Um, we're going to hit chapter seven, uh, part two and non-refundable credits. Um, you know, in the classroom sessions, we break this into two, but, uh, you know, we're just kind of limited to one here on this. Um, so we're going to talk about chapter seven in the second half of our non-refundable or our Pac-Man credits. Okay. All right. So on this one, we're going to talk about child independent care credit. Uh, we've touched on it a little bit already but we're gonna talk about that retirement savings contributions credit, the savers credit, uh, residential energy credit. You know, it, that thing's been like nine, you know, it's like a cat, it's had nine lives and it just keeps coming back and, and, and resurrected from the death and comes back again and again and again. But we'll talk about that. Uh, uh, adoption credits, we'll talk about that and a little bit about the credit for elderly or disabled, okay? So we're gonna go through and we're gonna start out here with our child and dependent care credit, okay? Uh, remember I mentioned, and we had the, the one, uh, the one uh, question off the quiz, talked about it, that the child and dependent care credit is a non-refundable credit available to those taxpayers who pay for credit for a dependent who is under age 13. Remember that one question had that as a selection. 
um, or for a spouse or dependent who is not able to care for his or herself. Might be mom and dad, okay? Um, this is a great credit, um, you know, that, that helps those people. By no means, is, it is a non-refundable credit. So again, it only eats up our tax bill. And by no means is it a dollar for dollar credit, okay? That for every dollar you spend, you get a credit. Um, if that were the case, um, what I see and, and, you know, I obviously my grandchildren were here and, and I understand what my son and daughter-in-law uh, pay for some of their child care so that they can both work. And I see some of the, the tuition, uh, well, yeah, it's almost like tuition, I guess. But I see some of the, the statements that come in for what uh, some people pay for their child care. Um, you know, nobody would ever pay taxes again if they had kids under the age of 12, or excuse me, under the age of 13, that uh, they were getting a dollar for dollar credit for their child care. And that is not the case. You know, it's the case here that, <coughs> excuse me, that this is a credit that just helps people um, offset some of their, their costs, okay? Now, dependent care benefits, though, have become a big benefit as far as employers for their employees. Um, you know, as it says here, if a taxpayer received dependent care benefits during the year, the amount of credit may be reduced. The benefits may include, um, you know, those paid uh, directly to the taxpayer or a care provider. Um, you know, FSAs are becoming a big thing. Um, that, uh, you know, as part of their flexible spending accounts, their benefits that they get from employers, they may get money. Um, there's a box on the W-2. I don't know if you've noticed, but that's the case on the W-2 that you have those. So those are uh, for um, uh, money that uh, you can use towards child care, or whatever you want to use it for. But again, those are not monies that would count if those are given by the employer. Okay. Uh, the little test here we have, whoops, the little test we have here. Uh, to claim the credit, the care must be for one or more qualifying persons. Again, it is a dependent care. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that it's a qualifying child. You know, if we have mom and or dad that is living with us and we claim as a dependent, and uh, example is my daughter-in-law um, is uh, OT and she has a practice where she works with people that have dementia and uh, Alzheimer's. In a situation like that, obviously they cannot be left alone. Um, if it's the case that somebody needs to work, and that uh, parent or relative or whatever that's living with them, that is, they're claiming is dependent, has to go to a setting so that they have somebody that can watch them um, or even come into the house, then you know that may be the case, okay? Um, so we have that. Um, the taxpayer must have earned income. Um, again, you know, that's, that's definitely the case on that. Uh, expenses uh, must be paid so the taxpayer can work or look for work. Okay, so this is a case where maybe somebody's between careers. Um, I have a client uh, for a couple years. Uh, she got divorced, went back to college. Uh, while she was, you know, you know, had her settlement, uh, she decided she wanted to start a career that she'd never had the opportunity to do. Um, she went back to school and, and had some things where she was looking for work after she graduated. And, you know, while she was doing that, we could use that uh, dependent care, okay? Uh, the payments must be made to someone the taxpayer cannot claim as a dependent. So, sorry to burst everybody's bubble, but if you've been paying your son or daughter to watch the rest of the kids and you're thinking, hmm, I could take that as a credit now. Nope, not the case, okay? All right, so we have all those, okay? Uh, we'll see this much more when we get into the, the doing the problem, but uh, you know, really what this is basically saying, this is a credit. Um, you know, it's a credit that is, is diminished a little bit. Um, it's not a dollar for dollar credit, but it is a credit that we get um, towards uh, paying uh, the tuition, okay? Um, one of the tests is the provider identification test. Uh, basically what that test is saying is that, hey, is this person accepting that as income? What I mean by that, I go back to my statement that I make quite often that the IRS likes to see both sides of the equation. If it's somebody writing it off as an expense and it's somebody taking it as a um, expense, then somebody has to declare it as income. So if you are paying um, you know, somebody to watch your children and you take it as a credit, then that person, okay, you know, the quote unquote, the lady next door, all right, has to understand that they're going to have to take that as income. All right, so that has to be the case. 
And that means that on that tax return, that you're going to be putting their social security number because what's the IRS gonna do? Hey, we were reported that you have income. You did not show that on your tax return, okay? Because if they're doing daycare, basically they're self-employed, all right? So they need to make sure that they have that. You need to get that information and understand that they're gonna put that social security number on there and the IRS is gonna look for that as income. Okay. Now there are organizations like a church or a school where you can put tax exempt in there. Okay. Cause a lot of them don't have to have EIN numbers. So that does work too, but the lady next door cannot be tax exempt. Okay. Unless she set up a charitable contributions that she is a 501 C and she, everything that she's paid to watch kids, she turns around and gives it all away and doesn't make any money doing it. Maybe she get away with it. But chances are that's probably not the case, okay? All right, so we have that, okay? Again, some exercises that are in there, talk about it. Uh, when we get into the problem that we're gonna work on, um, we'll be able to see a little bit more of that, okay? Uh, the form, whoops. The form that we use for that is the 2441. Um, we'll talk about how on the tax return that that populates, but again, we see up at the top, you know, the care provider's name, the address, the identifying number. It's asking for a social security number or an EIN number. Again, if it's a tax exempt organization, we might put tax exempt in there. Okay. All right. So we have all that. Okay. All right. Um, they touch on this a little bit in here about employment taxes for household employers. Um, if you have somebody that's hired an au pair or a nanny, um, they'll be doing a schedule H, uh, you're really probably not ever going to see. Um, I do get a few of those, uh, you know, there used to be a, um, uh, what would they call it? Au pair international or whatever it was. There was this area where there was a lot of uh, Chinese kind of almost exchange students that were here living. Um, that were through this and, and we had to do a lot of Schedule H's, but you know, you're really not gonna see any of those. Um, so, but just know that if it's an employer, employer relation, employer, employee relationship that you have to do that Schedule H because basically, you know, one person has to declare his income, but since you're setting a schedule for them as an employee, um, employer, you basically need to make sure that you're providing and paying all the payroll taxes that you need to pay, okay? All right, okay. Again, a bunch of stuff on the dependent credit here. Uh, retirement savings contribution, we are on the, in the textbook. Let's see here, we're on page uh, 719. Uh, again, we talked about that, that 8880 credit that's on there. Um, a lot of times that will populate. Uh, maximum credit for it is $1,000, okay? Um, it shows all the eligible retirement contributions. Um, you know, we talked about that code D that we've started to see on our uh, W-2s that we, we put in there um, so that we have that. Um, so we have, um, you know, that, that income from that source, but you can see, you know, four or three Bs, you know, somebody's self-employed, they're SEP or they're simple. Um, you know, if they're making a, a contribution, you know, other than rollovers, um, you know, to an IRA where they might get a credit on the return too. So there's a lot of ways to take credit for the, or to get this credit, okay? So we just have to understand. But as I talked about, who can't take the credit? Retirement savings contribution credit is not available if either of the two following applies. In a household, if that household is married, filing joint, and uh, their AGI exceeds $63,000, they are not eligible, okay? Um, and again, we talked about some of the things that have on there about being a student um, and, and, and other things where they took money out in the last three years. But again, there's income thresholds for that. But again, it's a great credit. Um, a lot of times people don't realize about up to $1,000. And again, it's a credit, non-refundable. You know, we have to have a tax bill for us to take advantage of it, but obviously a very good credit to have, have as a, a part of our tax return. Uh, resident energy credit, um, pretty much all of it has disappeared, okay? Um, you know, 2017 saw the death, uh, finally, of the part about furnaces. You know, it used to be furnaces where, you know, you could get a credit for a furnace 
$1,500, you saw the advertisements, all right? Now that's gone. Basically, the only part of the credit that still exists is the credit for things like solar panels, uh, wind turbines, which I'm sure your neighbors would love you if you put one of those wind turbines in the backyard to get a credit, okay? Uh, the other one is geothermal. So besides taking the tax class and whatever else you're doing, you've got a lot of spare time and you wanna dig a really deep hole, you can do some geothermal. But basically what I'm saying is on all these is that, you know, those kind of, if you will, alternative energy forms, um, you know, the one thing that I will say on this, and again, I apologize if I got my editorial hat on again, at the malls and door to door and things like that, there are these uh, solar panel salesmen that say, hey, you can save up to $15,000 on your taxes or some out of the world number. Okay, and they say if you install these credits, yes, the solar panels cost you twenty-five thousand, but you can save fifteen thousand, um, you know, dollars on your tax return. That is true, but in order to do that, you have to have fifteen thousand dollars in tax. Okay, it is a non-refundable credit. We have had a couple instances where some individuals in their retirement say, this is great. I'm going to put solar panels on it. I'm not going to have to pay taxes. And my electric bill for the year is going to be $10. Okay. Well, the nice thing about the credit, it does roll over. You can carry it over year to year to year. And we had a couple individuals that that is what they're going to be doing for a long time to come because it's going to take them forever to try to recoup this. Okay. But they got these panels and we did their tax return. They looked at us and says, no, you messed up on my tax return. The guy that sold me the solar panels said that I was going to get $10,000. Well, yeah, you are, but you don't have $10,000 in taxes. Okay. So basically what I'm saying is on these credits, if you hear somebody that's buying solar panels, be very, very careful. Okay. Because they're not going to get that credit. Okay. It is not a refundable credit, all right? Uh, next credit that we're gonna talk about is the adoption credit, okay? Uh, form 8839, a great, great credit, okay? I commend the people. I think I mentioned it earlier. Um, I have uh, several uh, clients that I've gotten uh, to work with and, and it keeps growing every year that are foster parents and, and because of their situations with the kids and and the parents that they ended up adopting the kids, which I think is outstanding. And uh, really, really commend them for, for, for stepping up in situations like that. But, you know, as I can say here is that, you know, we can take a credit uh, for qualified, again, we heard that word, qualifying, qualified adoption expenses. In this case, the adoption expenses are the, you know, fees, the attorney fees, court costs, traveling expenses, including meals and lodging while away from home, and re-adoption expenses, okay? Um, traveling, I'm gonna go to South America and adopt a child. I go down there. Now, sometimes what happens too is when you come back into the States, it may be the case that the adoption law that was used to adopt the child in a foreign country is not the same as what it was here, so maybe you have more expenses and you have to re-adopt, okay? So that may be the case too, all right? Okay. Um, obviously, qualified adoption expenses that don't include expenses. Um, if you're, <coughs> excuse me, adopting your child on the black market, uh, chances are you're not going to be able to take the credit, okay? All right. Um, as it says here, the income exclusion of up to $13,810 per child is available for employer provided benefits, okay? Um, this is a great credit. The adoption credit is $13,810. Unbelievable. Okay. Now you do get to carry it forward for five years. So again, non-refundable credit. We may not get to use it. Our Pac-Man ran out of little dots to eat up, but we can carry it forward. Okay. Now there's some little nuances that allow you to get that credit too, because sometimes if a child is, um, such that they are a, um, difficult adoption, if you will, and they will call it special needs. What that means is that the state agency has determined that, okay? Um, 
And it, sometimes it's not just what we think of as special needs. You get the full credit no matter what for what you take. And, and what I mean by that is that if it's a uh, set of twins or it might be um, from a, a certain ethnic or you know um, background, or it may be the case that it is a um, family that you have to keep all three to get kids together. Those are kind of special needs. And, and the state really outlines as to what that is and they determine that. But uh, you know, again, those you pretty much get the full credit no matter what, okay? There's no reducing of it, all right, okay? All right, so we have our adoption credit that's on there. Again, a lot of information that's in there supporting with it. Uh, we're gonna talk about more of it as we go through, okay? So we have that. All right, okay, all right. And then the last one is a credit for elderly or the disabled. Um, again, this is one that, that, that has kind of a narrow little window, but we have such that we have um, the uh, elderly, um, you know, or the disabled that they get a credit. You know, the income has to be just right, uh, totally uh, permanently disabled. Um, you know, so we see this at times, um, but you know, don't see it very often. Um, here are those income limits for them to qualify. Um, you know, again, when we look at these incomes, it, it, it's pretty sorry state of affairs that we have to have an income that is that low. Uh, but you know, again, there's a credit out there. Um, chances are some of these people may not need to file, um, but you know, if they are filing and they fall in this, then there's a credit there for them. And again keeps money in their pocket and minimizes their tax. Okay, so we have that, all right. Okay, so we have those for them. And that is done on the Schedule R, as it says there. Okay, so that is the Schedule R, all right. Okay, so that's Chapter 7, okay. We're gonna do one problem here, all right. So we have one that we're gonna do. And if you want to turn in your workbook to uh, chapter seven, uh, we're actually on page seven five. It's, it's problem seven one, Nancy Reader. Okay, so that's uh, chapter seven, uh, problem seven one on page seven dash five of your workbook. Okay, all right. Okay. All right. Okay, so we have that. All right. So we have Nancy Reader here. Again, I talked about earlier, you know, I'm hoping that everybody's getting comfortable with the, um, the, the worksheets, uh, excuse me, the main information pages, uh, so that we have that. Um, she has a qualifying child, but uh, on our bullet points here, uh, she filed a 1040A last year. She does not itemize. Uh, she liked the money to go in her bank account. Um, you know, she has the main information. Again, we see the statement about the full-time, not a full-time student, and no distributions in the last three years. No EIC was disallowed, and she had health insurance the entire year. Okay, so we have Nancy, and on her main information page, we see her information there, uh, and she's actually, you know, appears to be a single mom. Um, has three kids, okay, that she has on the return there. So we have her as head of household. We have George, Mary, and Samuel, okay. So we have the three there, all right. And we can see over here what we did is that we found out, and when we were doing the return, we found out from Nancy that uh, um, Mary and, oops, hold on one second here. Okay, that, uh, that Mary and Samuel, the younger, the 11 and seven year old, they are in some child or dependent care. So we put dependent care and we check the box there. What that did is it populated and on our tree on the left, we can see over here that we have a form 2441 that was populated, okay? So that would pop up on our tree on the left with that little red exclamation point there, says, hey, I need to address this. Okay, um, EIC, again, I always check that because I'd hate to leave money on the table and I forgot to check that and they would have qualified for the earned income credit, okay? 
All right, so we have that. Okay. All right, we have, uh, they live in New York all year long. And again, main information page, you know, pretty much what we've talked about going through there. Okay. All right. First thing we have from Nancy is she is working at Pizza on the Corner. All right, so we got her W-2. Uh, we check the taxpayer. We double check the address to make sure it lines up. Uh, we put in her EIN number. Um, I do apologize that, uh, you know, right now when you're doing the problems that uh, a lot of those you have that um, you're having to type in all the information. Uh, we have a very large database of, uh, you know, employers um, that we have from EINs that this will automatically populate, but right now we have to put a lot of them in, okay? Now, I have my wages, uh, I have my withholding, uh, do not see any contributions to any retirement. Uh, we got rid of the red with the F3 that was in the amount box. And again, can't stress enough, out of sight, out of mind, down here at the bottom, okay? That's the state withholding, all right? So we have that, okay? Um, as far as the health insurance, it was mentioned in a bullet point um, that we have, whoops, that we have um, uh, health insurance for the entire year. Um, as we see here, Nancy is on there, okay? Now, the first question says here, did the taxpayer, spouse, or any independent receive insurance through the marketplace? Um, New York State of Health now does Medicaid, it also does um, the essential plan, all right, and Child Health Plus. So if it's the case that they have those three, they can get them through the marketplace, but there is no subsidy or credit for them paying their premium. They just have a lower premium. So that means that we do not answer yes, we'll answer no. So basically, kind of sounds backwards. What happened is that Medicaid, Child Health Plus or the $20 a month essential plan, if they have those, okay, we have to realize that they uh, are in the marketplace, but we check no here. And again, all 12 months they have insurance, so we'll check that first box here. Uh, the second line on this uh, where it says about marketplace exemption, um, probably not going to see that for 2019 because that would be the mandate. We try to get an exemption for something that. Uh, you know, right now is no longer law. So we'd have something different with that, okay? All right, now, as I said, if you look at the bottom of page seven, seven, we have uh, Mother's Helper. It's a little daycare center that uh, Nancy is using for Samuel and Mary. And if we remember on our um, main information page, you know, where we have the kids' names, we checked, the DC for dependent care. So, you know, always a good interview skill as you're going along. If you want to remember to ask, um, you know, hey, I see you have young children, you're working. Did you have any dependent or child care that we need to cover? Okay, so we have that. All right. Now, that form, once we're there, we have mother's help. Okay, so we have that. Um, you can see here that the address is on that. All right. 16 Main Street, we put that in, check that they had an EIN number, which is on the document there, and the total amount paid was $1,700, okay? All right, so we have that, okay? So the $1,700 we see and we check the box, so Mary and Samuel's name had come over here on the main info, so we have $1,200 and $500. These two numbers need to add up to the number that we're putting up here at the top. Okay, if they don't, you're probably going to get an error and something's going to have to go on. Okay, so we have that. All right, now the $1,700, we have that. We can see from the income, uh, there's a little calculation. Um, I talked about the fact that uh, this is discounted a little bit, um, the applicable amount there. Uh, so we have that 20% uh, of what they had, $340. Okay, so there's their credit. All right, and based on income, there are some limitations that happen there. Now, one thing that does happen sometimes is that we will have, um, you know, where they can get money from their uh, employers to help pay for dependent cost. And what that happens is, and, and two, I'm gonna remember everybody, if you wanna play with your returns, 
if you go to file and it comes down to hit the what if mode, everything turns green, okay? So on this one, I'm gonna say, you know, this pizza on the corner that uh, Nancy works for, great place to work for. She gets $500 um, for dependent care benefits, okay? So as you can see, she got $500. Well, what that does is it changes the way our form works, okay? So even though she paid $1,700, 500 of that was from her employer. So you can see that that reduced it to 1,200, the amount that she does for the calculation, and she only gets a credit for 240 because her employer was paying part of it, okay? All right, so that's the way that that would work, all right? Also, what comes into play then, there's the second page of the, um, the um, uh, 2441 for the dependent care benefits. You can see the 500, and sometimes, as you see down here, if they take too much, okay, or they get paid too much, some of that becomes taxable benefits. You know, it's kind of like scholarships and some of the other things, you know, you end up with taxable portions. Okay, because really you can only count the first 3,000. That's why I say when I see people that are spending what they're spending for all of these education, or excuse me, these um, uh, dependent care things, you know, um, you know, the doodle bugs of the world are not inexpensive. Okay, and once they have all that, then, you know, only the first 3,000 counts, and then we got the, you know, 20%, and, and as we keep whittling it down, the credit is pretty minimal, but it is a credit. Lowers our tax bill, every dollar helps, okay? Especially when you have a family, all right? Now, I did this what if, and I can go back to my what if, go to file, what if? It's gonna ask me a question, what if mode? Do you wanna replace it? I hit no, it does a little flashing here, and my return goes back to where it was originally, okay? All right, so that's a little bit about dependent care. Okay. All right. So I know we covered a lot of stuff. I uh, hope everybody's still awake out there, but uh, we covered a lot of stuff. I wanted to go back and rehash some stuff out of chapter four and five, uh, go over those problems. I think that's important. Um, I know there's a lot of material in chapter six and seven um, that we had to cover. So we want to make sure that we got that. Um, there's a lot of reading there. And like I said, there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, you can do on your own. I uh, wanted to make sure I did some problems for you um, on there. Um, we'll spend more and more time on the problems. I can lecture on the material just as well as the problems. Um, you know, that's the tough thing about the online is that I'm not there looking over your shoulder, peeking at your computer screen, trying to see what you're doing so that we know what you're doing with that, okay? But as I mentioned at the outset, what I am gonna do, um, I will be sending out obviously the homework um, I'll be sending out the recording of this lecture. Um, I'll be sending out the uh, uh, answers to the problems. Uh, I'll probably give them through chapter five. Um, you know, there's lots of problems in chapter seven to work on. Uh, so I'll have you work on those and, and some of them I'll have you turn in. Um, you know, and again, a few of them, um, if anybody has any specific requests, they can email me, uh, but I'll start to put into the Dropbox some of the PDFs. Uh, printouts of the returns. And then uh, next week, we'll, we'll go through a lot of the problems. Uh, we'll do a couple more chapters and things like that. Um, I cannot stress enough, though, if uh, you're still having trouble with the software, if there's any way you can get in here to the corporate office, I am happy to set with you. Okay. All right. Okay. So I'm happy to set with you uh, no matter what. Um, spend some time with you. If it's the case you can't make it in, I'm happy to, uh, you know, take and, and uh, do um, the, um, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one Zoom with you. Um, we can do that. We can talk, uh, things like that. So I'm happy to do that. Um, I, I want you to complete the class. Um, you know, obviously, I hope that all of you work for us. Um, some of the homework and the, the exercise I see you guys are doing great. Um, it's just difficult with an online. I don't have that one-on-one face-to-face -on -one time with the elect classrooms. Um, I do teach in Lockport on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 9 a.m. in the morning and 6 at night. You're always welcome to come and sit in on the class. I have people do that all the time, uh, especially if we have a concept that you're just not comfortable with that we can do that, okay? But uh, again, thanks for everybody coming out. I uh, hope everybody weathered the storm well. Uh, stay warm. 
Looking at the forecast, I hope everybody's battening down the hatches this weekend. Uh, forecast is not looking good. Uh, we have uh, 30s for a while to come, but uh, you know, when it's cold like this and, and the weather, you know, I, I guess uh, I, would, I would be, it would not be doing my job if I didn't say what a great time to sit down and work on your online tax and do your homework, okay? All right, okay, and again, Everybody have a great week. Um, please email me things. I look at the problems and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, please, please reach out so that we can work together on things. All right, everybody have a great week.